Right. Good morning. Thank you uh, for attending this LGBT History Month event. I want to I want to start by thanking Brian and the Diversity Council at the library for hosting this, uh, as well as the other folks I, I don't know who've been doing some really awesome ally work at the library. Since coming to Virginia Tech two years ago, I uh, have enjoyed the the library's support of uh, LGBTQ efforts, including things like uh, rainbow unicorns on the website and whatnot. Um, very very cool. So I will I will jump in today. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some images here that, that don't really have any content specific to the talk, but they're just going to kind of set some context and background. Um, so I'll begin. There we go. Today, I will have a difficult time keeping my voice down. In early September of 1998, I drove with my mom from San Antonio, Texas to Corvallis, Oregon. On the way, we made a brief stop in Laramie, Wyoming. At the time, I thought nothing of it, an unmemorable detail. Until one month later when I stood, candle in hand, with several hundred people outside our student union mourning the death of Matthew Shepard. Something previously quiet, something quieted, had awoken in me, and I could not figure out what. I knew, though, that something in me no longer wanted to feel hushed. What was this quiet? What was the new disquiet? Raised in South Texas, I had learned so well to follow the rules of my social uniform, act polite, treat elders with respect, sir and ma'am and whatnot. So what was the new trouble? It felt queer, and I needed it. I didn't quite understand it, but I knew I needed it, and it would take me some time to understand it. Over the years that followed, I would come to consider this disquiet as something that bound me up in LGBTQ history to a great many people far braver than I, to the people who bent the so-called arc of the moral universe, but not just a little. These makers of LGBTQ history contorted and twisted and strained the so-called arc, and they decorated it with glitter. And they had to, because otherwise justice would pass them by. Southern Lutherans, uh, Southern Lutherans are not supposed to talk like this, as I think some of you know. Growing up, I had heard enough people whisper something like, that boy just ain't right, and I used to live with the quiet. But this disquiet came over me, and standing there at the vigil for Shepard, I wondered. In 1969, the Stonewall riots broke against the tide of cruel police brutality, led by trans people, the names of many we may never know. And I think they must have felt this sort of disquiet. Harvey Milk must have felt this when he drew a great political movement around him, catalyzing a cultural revolution that outlives him even today. And on this day, in October, uh, October 17th in 1933, Albert Einstein arrived in the US fleeing Nazi persecution. Disquieted by racist discrimination at Princeton University, Einstein helped to found the Fledging Institute for Advanced Study for Scholars and Refuge from the status quo of the day. Gwen Smith must have felt this disquiet when she began Trans Day of Remembrance, and Bayard Rustin, too, must have felt something like this on silence when, in the 1960s, he helped to organize the March on Washington. And Gloria Anzaldúa told me once how she chose to be queer, unable to live like she was expected to quietly live. I think she, too, must have felt this. When Audre Lorde wrote in the early 1980s a newsletter to teachers, a brave act in the early 1980s, how there is no hierarchy of oppression, she disquieted the silences of racism among LGBT communities and the homophobia and transphobia among people of color. I think Suzanne Farr must feel this, so for many years, moving from state to state, she could organize uh, against the mean-spirited ballot measures and cruel political programs. And more recently, Malala Yousafzai, Yous pardon me, Yousafzai, lives on after a gunshot wound to the head and chooses to continue to speak out against brutal treatment of women, and perhaps she feels this too. And what do we make of Chelsea Manning and the disquieting act of sharing government secrets to WikiLeaks? What do we do with the disquieting, unsettling queer feelings? To talk of LGBT history without talking about queer history would quietly gloss over our past at the expense of our future. Queer, a silly little word, kind of a sissy or pansy of a term, really, a prissy, impertinent, and incredulous term. The term queer has all sorts of problems. Sometimes it drags along racist, classist, ethnocentric, and transphobic problems. And at the same time, the reclamation of queer as a matter of liberation was wrought by the life and labor and even the bloodshed of real people and imbued with emancipatory potential. Give queer some consideration for a bit and think about what the word invokes. Unruly, disquieting, unpatriotic, playful, campy, irritating unusual, disruptive, insufferable, strange, oh so strange, caring, slutty, complex, sullen, peculiar, bizarre, freakish, uncanny, and the list goes on. 
Queer won't fit. Queer often won't feel pride. So what do we do with this? We have this problem with pride in LGBT history and queer, you see. The two don't always get along. Sometimes we gather up our fears and use pride to quiet the queer. Hey, you're a proud hokey, right? You have pride in hokey nation, I'm sure. Let me help you in your maroon and orange uniform, and then you can feel safe. Get cinched up in a tight corset of school pride. Don't breathe too freely. Stay quiet, and you too can belong. What sort of LGBT history do we need to talk about? Do people feel disquieted here at Virginia Tech? Do we let people speak honestly in their own unruly voices? Do we trust one another to feel this way and to do anything about it? How can anyone feel pride here if we have to dress up queer in a quiet, proper uniform? How can anyone act queer if we keep nodding along ever so politely to the numb voices of caution? I think you know these numbing voices all too well. Be professional, they say. We can't move too fast. Wait, the time will come. You want that letter of recommendation, don't you? You don't want to upset anyone that could have consequences. Maybe now isn't a good time. I'm not sure they'll give us permission to do that. Have you given any thought to how this might impact your future? So when you feel like a heretic, do you have anyone to tell who won't try to shut you up? When you try to talk like an honest dissident in order to protect your last shred of dignity, does anyone listen who doesn't then try to round off the unsettling sharp edges or turn down the volume? Maybe I take this too far. Don't we have some LGBT history to feel proud of? Very many people in the history of the school and the state have labored hard to unmake the quiet uniform of stifling conformity. They've taken great risks. In fact, I would have no platform to speak like this today if not for people who have put themselves at risk to queer the forum. Don't we have to regard their work as queer? Yes, of course we do. We also have to think more carefully about the differences between instances and trends. To emphasize only the episodes and instances of queer, disruptive, emancipatory change, that's a different question than the one I think we need to ask. What about the overall pattern of our history here? I do not think we can stop at a question about particular instances. Rather, I wonder, has Virginia Tech had a queer uprising? Has Virginia Tech benefited from anything like the queer movements that cropped up in the early 1990s? From around 1990 to 2004, rising on the shoulders of anti-racist, feminist, disabilities, and gay and lesbian rights movements, things changed on college and university campuses and in high schools around the country. During the era and since, campuses have played host to all sorts of flaming, campy, and flamboyant starbursts of disquieting refusal to wear the uniformity of pride the way a decently ambitious and simultaneously self-loathing person should. An era of lascivious political magic and red Nancy Sinatra boots for some campuses. But for some campuses, this remained an era of undercomplicated khaki pants and respectable knee-length skirts. I like to try to predict the exact moment in a talk when the person who organized it starts to wonder, what have I done? Like, no, we're good, we're good. Maybe in that formative era in LGBTQ community, um, some people started to notice. Sometimes we're fat, sometimes we're poor. My gosh, our skin comes in all sorts of shades and sometimes we're slutty and some of us wear hijab and our bodies don't all have the same parts. Then there's that problem with the way we keep meeting on the internet or in rest areas and public parks since we uh, meet elsewhere and get hurt. And oh heavens, sometimes we gossip in church and sometimes we ask the uncomfortable questions and direct questions or the questions that get shit done. And then a voice comes in refrain from the pulpit, dressed in a dry, cleaned tie set just below a wry, forced smile. We just don't do things that way here. Why should anyone in the world let that phrase, we just don't do things that way here, work like an anesthetic? The very phrase was actually the first quietistic lesson I was told within the first month I arrived here. Quietistic sounds a bit like sadistic, doesn't it? We just don't do things that way here. Well, queer and disquiet, I do not always have patience for that. Something of our history hinges on disquieted impatience from time to time. I've had years and years to try and undo the quietistic tendencies that were reproduced in my mind. See, it feels queer just before I speak, and then it feels queer when I know someone hears the voice I used to try to keep to myself. And I know that some of the students, faculty, and staff, and alumni all over this campus know all too well what I have just tried to describe. So for the sake of LGBTQ History Month, let me disquiet some of the history we share. Only some of what I will tell you next actually happened. And some of what I tell you next could have happened. In 1978, the year I was born in San Antonio, Texas, by the way, students attempted to form the first gay student group, the Gay Student Alliance at Virginia Tech. 
But administration refused to recognize the organization and forbid them to meet on campus and even use Virginia Tech facilities. Students organized a letter writing campaign to alumni and businesses to join in an all VT boycott that got the attention of national gay and lesbian activists who in turn put pressure on administration. By 1979, the Gay Student Alliance dissolved under pressure from administration from some of the student body following a Denim Day show of support campaign. Uh, but only minimally deterred, community members found ways to <coughs> fundraise to bring in community organizers who helped them in strategies for movement building and coalition building. Or maybe not. By 1984, Lambda Horizons, the predecessor of the current LGBTA, reformed with the authorization of administration were again allowed to meet on campus. They quickly set about an educational campaign to bring attention to the rapid spread of a new virus, primarily targeting men who have sex with men. Moreover, they participated in broad sweeping coalition building, including anti-racist, anti-poverty, and pro-feminist movements. Burgeoning pride resulted in fostering broad and open campus discourse surrounding the need to change policies to make them more affirmative. Or maybe not. In 1991, the Board of Visitors voted to include sexual orientation in the non-discrimination policy. Soon after, the first trans and gender diverse work groups began to plan for the inclusion of gender identity and gender expression in the non-discrimination policy. Despite of a lack of awareness on campus, they found broad and encouraging support among faculty. Or maybe not. That same year, 1991, Lambda Horizons held the first ever National Coming Out Day on the lawn at Henderson Hall. Local television uh, reporters covered the event and the camera captured VT Corps of Cadets members harassing participants. Legislators in the state put earnest pressure on the core leadership to issue a formal apology and to insist on basic civility among members. In a town hall forum, LGBTA students and core members shared their accounts of what happened that day and agreed to partner in planning an annual ally building campaign. Or maybe not. 1994, request of Lambda Horizons, the LGBT caucus hosted a campus speak out in the library plaza in honor of National Coming Out Day. An unprecedented 500 to 600 students turned out for the event. Maybe not. By 1998, the Safe Zone program was established as a collaborative effort between the Demon Students Office, LGB Caucus, LGBTA, and the Office of Equity and Affirmative Action. But the tide turned when anti-LGBTA protesters from off-campus began holding on-campus demonstrations, condemning this as a sinful corruption of young adults. Students held peaceful demonstrations in response, raising the quality of conversations on campus by including the first ever LGBTA voices of Appalachia. And soon after, this blossomed into a regional community outreach campaign that eventually included environmental activism, community outreach and education projects, and the inter intercultural community organizing among students from urban and rural areas. Or maybe not. A setback in 2000, when for the first time, staff at campus gyms and recreational facilities denied access to families of LGBTQ employees, as well as women who didn't share their husbands' last names. And efforts to address this in conjunction with Women's Network are initially ignored by the administration. Faculty and students held a 12-day sit-in in Burris Hall outside the President's office. A delegation of community members issued a formal request for professional development programs for current and new employees. By the end of the sit-ins, administrators supported a revised version of the proposal. Or maybe not. In 2002, the university hired the first openly lesbian senior administrator. But unfortunately, the board takes action to deny an academic position to her partner. Initially, faculty organized teach-ins to educate students about the detrimental consequences of workplace discrimination. With growing pressure from anti-LGBTQ organizations off campus, administrators equivocate about challenging the BOV decision. Students gain the assistance of community organizers in hosting accountability sessions with the board. In time, the board concedes to the pressure and moves ahead with the decision to hire the dean's partner. It all was not secure. The following year in 2003, the Board of Visitors removed sexual orientation from the non-discrimination policy. The language is reinstated after another series of town hall meetings. Just recently in March 2010, the State Attorney General issued a letter claiming that Virginia's public colleges and universities could not protect LGBT students and employees from discrimination. And what can we do about this? Today, the non-discrimination policy still does not include gender identity and expression. And what can we say about this? Today, LGBTQ employees still do not have all sorts of legally available benefits for their partners and families. And how might we unsilence this? Have our communities made peace with indigenous communities on whose land we now live? We've got to do something about that. So what do we do? What do we do with the queer disquiet? Activism, scholarship, event planning, memorial runs, cheering at football games. Something important and far bigger than queer pride happened as part of the movements that began to surge in the 1990s. These movements around the country catalyzed into coalition work against racism and ableism, against rape and sexual assault. 
On campuses where queer movements rose up and thrived, there also arose movements for reconsidering body dysmorphia, movements against poverty and for immigrant rights. Queer movements have in many places helped to bolster new waves of emancipatory thought. But don't get me wrong, queer movements still fall prey to white supremacist, capitalist, transphobic, patriarchal imperialism. And queers also help to make interventions against those very same problems. In my own alma mater, I could not learn so much. I, like so many others, had to look outside the academy for the skills, mentoring, and knowledge to do something different than to figure out new ways of staying quiet. If not for organizations like the Midwest Academy, United States Student Association, Oregon Student Association, National Black Justice Coalition, uh, National Conference of Community and Justice, Woodhold Freedom Foundation, I would have stayed quiet. But I want you to notice something. Consistently, most of the people in these organizations I had met came from campuses where queer pride uprisings had altered the status quo. They came from schools in Wisconsin, Maryland, Texas, Oregon, California, Washington, New Jersey, and all over. Some had never gone on to post-secondary education, and some tried but couldn't endure their studies while working as an activist. But for so many, queer movements altered their campuses and gave them a way to disquiet history. Here at Virginia Tech, I think we have to consider some hard questions about quiet and uniformity as a campus made of many com communities. Does it work here at Virginia Tech to act from queer disquiet, to go about queering the classrooms and the drill field and the labs? Do we get to go about unhushing ourselves? Do we get to cause trouble and make waves due to the impatient nagging that protects our dignity? What do we do with the voice that sometimes doubts itself, but also knows better when everyone else goes along quietly with the usual flow? What does the title of this talk call forth? Can Virginia Tech pride it forward? It's a really weird question. It puts together the colloquialism of paying it forward with the need for revising our feelings of pride. Can we put forward our feelings of pride in a way that disquiets and at the same time honors what we have accomplished? What if queer never happens here? Maybe a queer movement has never happened here. Or maybe it has happened here in a way that uniquely queers the quiet uniform. Maybe things do work differently here and some form of queer movement has infiltrated the seemingly transphobic and homophobic norms of the university. Or maybe a queer movement of some kind or another waits just around the corner, a simmering potential awaiting a catalyst. I cannot say for sure. But if we intend to take pride in LGBT and queer history, I think we have to go out on a limb and do some unusual things. To unsettle the questions, to imagine a Virginia Tech that we may yet bring about to make the history we want to tell with pride that goes even beyond merely queer and LGBT pride. And let me make one last thing clear. We have plenty of what we need. Despite the myths of scarcity, the false belief we do not have enough of what we need, and the voices telling us that we do not have enough resources, we really do. At least enough to feasibly get something started. We have the talent, we have the energy, we have the allies, and if in some ways we do not yet have what we need, we at least have enough to start working for it. Suppose we can make this place the number one choice for LGBTQ and allied students and faculty in the state, in the region, and in the nation. Maybe we get to make a different history. What if queer never happens here? I leave you with that question and I return to where I began. Today, I will have a difficult time keeping my voice down. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Questions, reactions. A slide you want to see again. <coughs> They'll come back around. Um, I think just by doing events like this, we're helping to raise awareness, and uh, mm. you know, the more the more events we do like this, the better. And uh, I do feel like visibility at tech is very dismal. Um, so the more things we can do to kind of let people know that we're here. I think that can help. Uh, one, of my, one of my mentors, you know, somebody I haven't spent a lot of time with, but the bits of time I've spent with her have been incredibly influential. Um, Suzanne Farr writes about vision 
Um, if you could imagine the best of all possible circumstances, you think, what would this be like if, if we had everything we need? Um, you can take some time to do that. And you see that you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, events like this may not have happened. So pay attention to the progress, but also imagine what this could look like, and don't forget to do that vision work. Yeah. I think the, the colloquialism, don't rest on your laurels. Is that what it, is that what it does? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen as much um, allied direction given and guidance. Now, that's not to say that it's any single person's or entity's responsibility, but um, I wonder what, in your impression, and where can I go to get more of those impressions? Sure. Uh, should we be doing? Okay. So, yeah, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some of the context first. Uh, people who want to do ally work. Right? Some people have motives to do ally work, interest in ally work. Um, we worry about our own biases. We worry there are ways to mess this up, particularly if we don't come from a community, right? We don't come from a community where we've grown up in the circumstance and we share the circumstances. I think that's some of the context or some of the concern. And then the question, where can I go to, to get to do something about this? Um, so you've opened this door for me, which is where I get to respond and say, I, you know, here's, here's what I've seen work. Um, I think we need to educate students. I think we need to alter the basic curriculum that students have to study not just cultural diversity, but I think students also have to study non discrimination So you have to basically study the history of discrimination. And some schools around the country do this. Coursework that requires them as part of their core requirements to study the history of discrimination in the context of the U.S., not externalized to some other country. So we, change, we actually change the curriculum. Um, we change the job descriptions, completely legal to say, we do not hire any senior administrator or managerial personnel who hasn't shown a demonstrated commitment to social justice or diversity. Completely legal if it's a priority. Um, but there's a skill set, right? So those are, some, those are some environmental and institutional things. There's a skill set. Whether we call it uh, human relations facilitation or intercultural dialogue or community organizing, there are actual methodologies, ta tactics, skills, strategies that people have been working with for over a century now, at least in the Western industrialized world and much longer before that, um, that help. You learn, learn to listen, you learn to remain attentive, to remain committed. And so mo the mistake, I think, would be to hear what I just said as something like a lofty gesture at some cool values or ideologies. There are actual skill sets and people who are trained and um, in the region who know how to teach these kinds of skill sets and lessons. And then you have people who can go out and do coalition work and do human relations work. And um, Retain some of the, the good-hearted worry about biases, but don't let it interfere. It informs you, it educates you, but it doesn't hinder, it doesn't cause setbacks. I'm so paralyzed, um, like to use a better term, incapacitated with identity politics that I can't act. I don't think we can't do that. There's skill sets. We have options. Gandhi spent a good deal of time in jail in Johannesburg learning these things practicing these things, figuring out how to teach these things. Taught them to King, taught them to Chavez, Bernice Johnson Regan. I will take you to Richmond and to DC and I will teach you to lobby. This would be my full-time job. I can help you make posters. We'd have to want to do it. Josh. Are there any, I guess, informal ways to get the skill sets out of other than <laughs> the hardcore kind of meetings like four day events? Or you pretty much go through the transforming that you into it with going on in certain situations? Or even yeah. something like safe zone. I mean, are there, yeah, what would be the informal way to get the skills out of the skills 
So how do, we, how do we get skill sets without every one of us ditching our current careers and going basically into the full life? It's, it's, a, it's an efficiency issue. Things I want to do with my life, and this, this won't, maybe this doesn't work as a commitment, but geez, I really see why we need to do this. It only takes a few. Certainly some of the thousands here would have willingness to learn new skill sets and learn different ways of doing things. Actually, only takes a few. Um, one, of the, one of the enduring myths of what I consider a, sort of patriarchal bias around leadership, that every one of us has to act as a leader in the same way, we act as catalysts. We only need a few catalysts. Um, the rest of us show up from time to time and pull the weight. But it doesn't mean we have to commit our entire lives to it. I think that's a deterring myth. It's going to take every one of us to go get the exact same <coughs> skill set. And yeah, another hindering thing like the identity politics. I mean, do we have, do we have, you know that these things called disorientation guides? Some of these campuses uh, that I have not referred to by name, but I could get a bit more specific. Um, students actually got together in the early 90s to create what are called disorientation guides. They could not on their conscience uh, let the central authorizing moneyed sources, um, <laughs> marketing, um, they couldn't let these departments um, tell the history of the university in a way that was disingenuous. And so they started creating disorientation guides where it used oral history, the history gathered by real students and alumni. And they would produce these and give these out to students. They still do this in some places. Um, so that students can come in with a, with a more comprehensive history of the institution. Um, instead of treating people like they can't right, handle it or they won't, they won't feel proud of being here if they know the full scope of how things have gone well and gone bad. And the disorientation guides include both successes and, and traumas. Um, those are other things that kind of, that they just sort of keep going. You can keep printing those and handing them out. Um, that's not the way we do things here, I got told. Month one. Why not? Yeah, that's what I wonder. And who said that? I don't want to say. Um, <laughs> I mean, because... I mean, what keeps us from doing yeah. it anyway? Yeah. I, I, so, what keeps us from doing it anyway? Fear or ambition? Maybe that we don't have enough catalysts to get us in the room. There's, there's the next talk. Brian, can I have the room next week? <laughs> you know, um, what keeps us from doing it anyway? If we, if we left now with that question hanging, I'd be fine. Let's work on that question. Instead of waiting for the LGBT community to present to me how I can help, you know, make it right, I, I found that you have to go out and create it yourself. Like, I think that um, I would like to see, uh, and it, it kind of sounds campy, but if we could just yeah. get the LGBT community to create a um, allies for dummies, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> Safe zone. It, it would be fun. <laughs> just and, not for dummies, but. Right on. Because we need to be make sure we're good with it, you know. And I asked them about it. And do they have? Do they talk about inclusion? Yeah. And they're like, nobody's ever presented it to us. Of course, it would be fine. You know, everything's good. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you know, you're about 300 people. You know, and it, it's a older generation, so I'm going to be sticking around to make sure everything's always good. And that's something that you do when you're away from an LGBT, LGBT event, and that's something that I think the rest. I hope that everybody's doing that are allies. Mm. I don't know if they are or not, but we should be gathering in our own ways and sharing our ideas <coughs> to make sure it's, it's done. I like this a lot. So, I mean, first, with no permission to speak on behalf of my communities, thanks. Um, 
so, but thank you. The other thing is, I want to I want to queer this a bit. Uh, some of some of the skill sets for queer activism involve gift and invitation. Uh, we can go to communities with whom we share some interest, right? Communities who endure some similar troubles, not the same, but some similar troubles, and offer to help pick up their work and expect nothing in return at the, at the initial point. I mean, you can't. You go and you make a gift, you give it away, you make a contribution. And in response to Corey's question, in doing that labor together, I think we learn, we unlearn the biases. Um, and then the invitation, um, continue extending an open invitation for people to continue making contributions, similar to the invitation I think you extend when you issue those kinds of questions. But uh, it, I, I, just, I just don't think ally work I don't think we can do it one-sided. I don't think we can just say, let's get more allies to back us. I think we actually have to go out and make an effortful contribution and just forego the idea that we may actually get anything in return. It's a gift. It, that's what allies do. You give it up, you make the contribution. And yeah, so. These are good questions. Other thoughts? Yeah, Danny. So as someone, too, new here uh, at Virginia Tech, um, it was very much uh, expressed to me during the interview process that there is this disconnect that's happening. Um, I mm. think that's really the only word I can put to it. Um, we talked about values, and I wonder, um, and you talked about it in terms of, especially within student affairs, our aspirations for student learning. And I was wondering if you could speak mm. to Mm -hmm. I wish I had the poem with me. I wish I had memorized it. Um, there's a poem, a circular, you can find on the internet. It says, um, really, if you, so it's this visioning idea. Um, so I, I, want a, I want a president who's HIV positive. I want a president in a wheelchair. And I'm talking about the president of the United States. I want a president who has um, more than one partner at the same time. I want a president who um, speaks five languages. You know, this idea of... Um, Imagine, imagine the people and the lives that no one ever thought as the forefront of the institution when they wrote those things. And make a comparison. When you look at these aspirations for student learning, um, if you put those sorts, if you sat down with a group of people who are radically disenfranchised and you said, um, tell me what we should aspire to teaching students, I can almost guarantee the list of aspirations for student learning they make will not match that list. There will be some overlap, but it's not going to look the same. Um, it'll get called radical. <coughs> it'll get downplayed. Um, cast standards. Familiar with these? They're cast standards for yeah. So they're cast standards for for LGBTQ programs on campus. Um, those put those next to the next to the aspirations for student learning and notice notice the different priorities. Um, those are my initial thoughts. Ask the people who get left out, and then look at some of the work that was already done to make similar aspirations, but by communities who've been left out historically. Such a, such a passive use of euphemism, have been left out. It's a bad euphemism. Who, who uh, some people excluded actively and unintentionally. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. All right. So the question: How do we queer courageous leadership? How do we inspire courageous leadership when courageous leadership appears in the aspirations for student learning? Uh, whatever version, when I hear when I hear courage, uh, I wanna I wanna queer that like you're saying and think revolutionary. Let me let me think about this. Um, let's do something revolutionary. Let's do something transformative. Get under that. Get under the skin of that. What actually counts as revolutionary? I think revolutionary acts are the kinds of things in which you 
um, you act with no guarantee. You demonstrate the willingness to give up the way things have always been with no guarantee that things are going to get better, but the hope and determination to make them better. That kind of revolutionary courage, I don't think they had that in mind. Maybe they did. But think about that. Imagine if somebody said to you from day one, imagine that you could help make us this, this place, make it better, the number one place, by um, letting go of the comfort you have, the status quo you have. Give up the way things have, have worked. And let me help you develop a commitment to making it better. We have no guarantee there. We're just going to try. I think that differs from courage. But again, if we ask people who some have excluded, I think they would have a different story than I do, and we should listen to that. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Students at Radford asked me yesterday when I was teaching, um, is there anything fun in this class or happy? And I said, no, I'm trained as a philosopher. I don't really do that. Um, but you'll get something, right? There was, there's some joy in there. Um, I, take that as a, I take that as a provocation. <laughs> I need to <laughs> calm down a little, maybe. Deliver it. I... Yes? I'm a guest here, I'm a visitor, and I don't want to identify with Where yeah. I'm coming from, there are organizations which are responsible for the management. And it's a bad word for, for sometimes people perceive it to be a bad word, although I advocate it, for the management of Korean history. Hmm. And the management of queer modern history, queer heritage. Mm -hmm. And it's actually managed. And most of, in such a meeting, I think the proportion will be that most of the people that to attend the room will be heterosexual people, mm -hmm. will be highly involved in this. What to do with gay identity in the public arena? I'm asking you because, not because from, from a university where everyone have, who has these colors, like I think that four out of five students have this, one of those colors on them, I wouldn't have any expectations. However, on a broader level, is there any organization which is responsible for this in, in the U.S.? Curating. Creating and managing. The repository of history. Gay, lesbian, heritage, huh. GLBT. Yeah. Bring it in. Sure. I, I know yeah. yeah. A good question. So is, is there an organization in the U.S. that, that acts as a curator? Like uh, there is in the sure. U.K., like there is in Israel, sure. like there is... Is there such an organization or... I may have to pull from the, this is a good question, I may have to pull from the knowledge in the room because the Stonewall Center, so Stonewall Center in New York, National Black Justice Coalition, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and Human Rights Campaign have done history, but, but it's funny, um, I can't think of the one. Like I can't, it doesn't, it doesn't jump to mind, you know, so that's, that's an interesting provocation, like gee, shouldn't I, if we did have one, ought I not know about this? I'm, I'm simple, I'm happy. Yeah. I'll give you... When I come and study about the need, um, I'm coming from the area of public memory and tourism. Yes, and okay, and okay. And when I've done the study about, I think that any community needs to have a space, not a virtual space, a real space where they feel that it's part of their own heritage. This is my theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to be militarizing, specifically in this university, a space which they regard, even though they are secular, as holy, and even ready to fight for it. Hmm. While I did my study in Stonewall, you maybe, you maybe won't be shocked. Actually, this hmm. location um, is recognized as a heritage site, but I spoke with the owner as part of my fieldwork. Where, where is this again? Manhattan. Okay, yes. that one, the Stonewall Center. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. I told you, people coming all the way from Israel to this space because they think that it's a gay site or where it's supposed to be more linked to the women and, and lesbian women specifically. And he says, yes, I'm, I'm afraid to put it. So you, as an advocating the mm. certain ideological framework 
on the certain context of this university, why do you criticize this university if this nation mm -hmm. has no real heritage site and not a place where you can sure. have coffee sure. or sex? Sure. A real queer. Maybe on the other floors, but not the main floor. Yeah. Yeah. What a good question. So why, why criticize this university when our broader national, we don't, we don't have a national institution? We, we, don't, we don't have an institution for the integration. We've never had a desegregation integration institution in this country. Right after the, I'm just going to kind of come back around to your question. Right after the end of the Civil War, there was briefly an institution that, that was you know, tasked to do some integration work, but that was just radically destroyed very quickly. Um, we have all, there are all sorts of institutions, but as, a, as an act of liberation, and so this, this comes out of Latin American thought and liberation, as an act of liberation, uh, sweep your own front porch first. I, oh, I, sweep, sweep your own front porch first. This is where I work. This is the place. Okay. I'm going to look at the ground on which I live first. And that, right, that one part does not do all the work. I need to criticize here because I live here. Right? But I also, <laughs> I also have some need to, to get to DC and Manhattan and ask some other questions. Like I rely on creating change or a, or a National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. I rely on some of these organizations to do this work. But I mean, when, I, when I hear what you've just said, I think, gee, I should lobby them for this. The people who, who allegedly represent the communities to which I belong off and on, I should lobby them to help me out with this. I don't know. That's my reaction. I have to think more about that. Actually, through what's called grassroots heritage, mm -hmm. yes. many members of society can enjoy from such an initiative. Mm -hmm. And many not. Yeah. But here is a political fight. And specifically in this country, where uh, money talks, you have a very good chances to make it. Hmm. Hmm. We should think about this. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, there's, the, there's the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Right. Dot org, the NGL, NGLTF.org. And it has um, all the information on what our public policy and government affairs are, including things like with the, the census records, when they do the census sure. every 10 years, including people listed mm -hmm. as partners. But as a guest, as an observer, as yeah. a visiting scholar, oh, okay. my observation is that I'm actually astonished mm -hmm. that um, Thank you. you don't have a space, a heritage space. And my, like, based on studies about <coughs> identities and political identity, every community needs a space. On the mall in DC? Like on the National Mall? I'm curious what you have in mind. Yeah, I, like, like when you go when you when you go down the mall in DC, the museums, the the heritage sites, well, something. I you, but one can, and I'm from the industry who creates and sometimes invents heritage. Mm -hmm. I can give you many examples all over the sure. Europe and in Israel, sure. which made. A, I can give you an example where for a tree, mm -hmm. if a tree will be planted based on my surveys, mm -hmm. it right. could be a heritage site. Right. In Israel, there is a major museum for the Holocaust. And we take... And, and all, all the communities that have been murdered. Right. And one tree which will um, plant there with a gay flag mm -hmm. can cause people like yourself to take the airplane and go over there and identify with it and feel as a community. Mm. While here in this city, I wonder, I don't know. I see. You have all this, uh, this parrot, this hooky bird all over the city. Is there one with the gay flag on it? I'm asking. I don't know. I'm a guest. I have not seen one. You know, 10 is, There was an image of one in here, but yeah, no, I've not no, seen is one. Is there one yeah. over there in the, oh, yeah. everything should be with, even this thing is with this color. Sure. I guess we'd have to, we'd have to also follow the good example of taking youth to these sites, right? This happens in parts of the world where this is part of your right. Actually, one of my colleagues comes from Germany and at the risk of interrogating him a bit, I said, I've, I just am really curious, don't feel like to answer this, but did you grow up 
with a comprehensive education about the history of the Holocaust. And he said, oh, yes, we did. And they took us as children to the sites. It was part of our educational process. And I thought, gee, <laughs> what, you know, what kind of what work could we do there? Yeah, I'm with you. Right on. Uh, Danny. Speaking to that point, um, as an educator and someone who works specifically with uh, the student community who identifies as LGBTQ, it's a constant battle, um, not only for this generation, but older generations to consider ourselves in terms of culture and heritage. We don't do that. We don't speak of our, ourselves in terms of a cultural community. Um, and mm. I think that is a piece speaking to what you're talking about. We have to start talking about ourselves in terms of a cultural community um, and what our heritage is. The history is good, but I think there's power in that word. Um, but <coughs> I think mm. when we talk about queerness, per se, and maybe this is a, a strictly kind of academic sense of what it is, I think it, de it defies management. It defies boundaries. Um, and maybe that's part of the struggle. Um, hmm. That's just, you know, the conjecture over here. Maybe, maybe. Um, I want to pluralize that. I mean, we have, we have cultures. You know, we, we don't, we, we, we probably don't get to a monoculture, but we have culture. So I just want to pluralize that, you know, um, queer some of that, yeah. I don't, open, open question um, about cultures, sure. Other thoughts? Yeah? And I suppose speaking to the, the whole notion of having a space, I would be, somewhat suspicious on the same point. If you want to talk about um, a group that's having a sense of community, but you also want to talk about pluralizing it, then I feel like a lot of the times those spaces can become somewhat provincializing of that plurality, if not just becoming almost a tokenistic expression of, hey, let's all identify with this, now we're a community. And then we can leave and not have to deal with each other afterwards. So I guess. Could. Yeah. Could. Yeah, yeah, and what's the worry? Um, you, you to, to have a share in our heritage site, you'll have to put on a certain kind of uniform. Or you don't have to put on a uniform, but then you can show up, check in, and, and ditch. Um, yeah, things could go that way. Don't have to, right? I mean, part of the skill set I talk about and respond to Corey, you don't have to. Immediate opportunities. Uh, so I was taught after wrestling with the disquiet and then having to figure out I was only going to get some of the pieces from school, going out to these organizations that then trained me. I was taught you have to think of every immediate opportunity in terms of a long-term movement. You can't you can't do you can't separate them. Um, I was also taught never go to a meeting without a sign-up sheet. You never go to a meeting without a sign-up sheet, and you never go without somebody prepared to invite people to contribute. And this, I think, would take people on campus getting together and saying, what's the invitation we want to extend? If we're going to take little sign-up sheets for people to join on, or at least join some kind of listserv, um, figure out what invitation will get people to know, uh, the immediate opportunities, I think, involve just generally the long-term, so immediate opportunity, invite people to, to join in the conversation, long-term movement building, long-term capacity <coughs> building. That's the first. It's, um, should not go without saying that when we're in the process of hiring a senior administrator, we probably can come up collectively with all, we don't have to agree, actually we just don't have to agree. We can come up with all sorts of questions, provocative questions, queer questions, uncomfortable questions. And for posterity, the questions have been asked. Those, those two jump out. Um, Oh, how I wish I had more influence to change the undergraduate curriculum. 
if our students had to study as part of the core requirement, we said it was a priority that they had to study the history of institutional discrimination in this country from a perspective on power and difference and discrimination, if we had to do that, those, the things that students learned would require the rest of us to behave differently. They would start asking us to develop things that meet their needs. Does that make some sense? That's, a, that's not an immediate opportunity, but it, it um, so I'll confess, I came from a school where that was a requirement. Well, they're revitalizing, re revising that right now. But, the LA, I mean, sure. How do we, I mean, in the great mile away? Do we need an ear somewhere? You all know better than I do. I'm supposed to write and defend a dissertation. Like, I, I'll, you, you all who know better, you say, I'll show up. Like, and you say, I'll show up, I'll say the hard things. I'll say them with some respect, but I'll say the hard things. Put me up there. I don't know. I have to learn from you. I don't know who they are. There's some mysteries and cloaks up in the tower. I don't know. Or maybe they're in Fomoyer, or I don't know where they are. I don't know them. You might. Um, I will say, uh, within, within a short time, I did, take the, I did take the change in the curriculum idea to some senior administrators even gave them as a gift a copy of the book that chronologizes the different work that these programs have done around the country at different universities, and I was thanked for the book and politely told to have a nice day. It sits on the shelf of that person in the office. I'm sure it's never been cracked. So, I tried a little. I'm ready. <laughs> I can help with that part. Yeah. What? Um, it's called Teaching for Change. Last name of the primary editor is X-I-N-G, Jing. And it tells the story of uh, Oregon State University's development of what's called the Difference, Power, and Discrimination Requirement as a core requirement where they actually paid faculty to teach the courses and they paid them to learn how to teach the courses and then other schools around the country, a few started picking this requirement up. When you, teach, when you teach the least advantaged, freshest minds to ask the uncomfortable questions, the rest of us probably then have to do something with it. Like, I could go in and I can say, I need a new president, or I need a new staff member or administrator to do this, but frankly, if students start working together differently, if they start setting the expectation that administrators and staff and faculty have to behave differently and create some different things, we can work there. This uh, top-down doesn't have to be the only way to do it. When students start working together in ways they've never worked before, they will ask for something different than what they've asked for before. It doesn't have to come from the top down. Danny. I wonder, um, in terms of speaking about curriculum within the institution, I wonder does that then make the conversation, or does it take on kind of like a class type? Is the issue waiting until they get to college to start having these conversations? Um, I know we're here in, a, in a, an institutional setting of higher education. However, to me, it would seem like if, we, if there was some way we could start the conversation earlier. So I don't, and I don't know what that looks like, sure. how that happens. But it just concerns me that then it's only people who have access to higher education Right. Yeah. Um, let me let me uh, find the one that I like. Um, I like this one a lot. Uh, only some people got to do this. Right. I mean, you say drag it out in the open. Only some people get to do that. Only like some people. And, and we want to. And class is one thing. You talk about poverty. Class is one thing. Poverty. You add that in. Only some people get to do it. Um, only some people get to drag it out in the open. Yeah. We have to have that conversation. Do we have the resources to empower people or do their circumstances uh, require that we have to do the best work we can on their behalf, worrying about the biases and making apologies when we screw it up? When somebody comes back and says, um, don't rescue me, we respect that. But it's a land-grant institution. Land-grant public institution, when it's an interest in um, the uh, liberal and technical education of the population of the state. I like querying the land-grant mission. 4-H gets along with us, don't they? 
I don't know. Excellent question. I have to talk about it. You also give a talk like this, and then you see the facial expressions of the audience. <laughs> I was trying to evoke some smiles. Good. There were a few. Yeah, Ross. Yesterday, um, as one of our later events this month on the 30th, we're doing paragraph 175. Oh, yeah. And we're partnering <clears throat> with Hillel to do that. And yesterday, I was talking to the, the young lady who's going to be hosting the discussion afterwards. I'm going to be doing an intro for it since I teach LGBT mm -hmm. history in the Safe Center program. <clears throat> and I spend quite a bit of time on the Holocaust. And we were actually talking about um, how we bring that, how do we bring the Holocaust to today? Because she was talking about a lot of her peers who were raised here in the U.S. were, you know, taught the Holocaust, but it was primarily from a Jewish perspective. They didn't necessarily look at all the other groups as in depth as, you know, how Jews were treated in the Oh, how multiple groups were treated. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. And so that was one of the things that really interested her is to try to enlighten um, her community mm -hmm. in that it wasn't just Jews who were in the Holocaust, but there were all these other groups who were also persecuted mm -hmm. in that. And I know that, you know, uh, in particular, LGBT was the very last group to even be acknowledged by the German people and still... Mm -hmm. There have been no reparations to them versus other groups. So she was thinking about in the discussion, and I'm interested to see what questions she comes up with, and hopefully you all will come and see what questions she comes up with too. But she wants to bring that to today. Is you know one of the things we all said afterwards is we don't want this to happen again. But what does that mean today? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of her thought process, and it kind of goes along with what we're talking about here. You know, we all say we don't want this to happen again, but what does that actually mean? And what do we do to make sure that doesn't happen? Anti-LGBTQ apartheid continues to happen all over the world right now. You know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind around. It troubles me greatly that in some countries of the world, we know it's happening and we ignore it, but then it happens in places like Russia with lighter skin. Lots of people with lighter skin, and we pay really close attention to it there. In places in the world where the skin gets darker, we don't pay as close attention to it. That troubles me a lot. Um, what would you see as a need? What do you think we need to do? I mean, there's the heritage site, right? I mean, there's this idea of reparations and heritage site. What do you see? You do LGBT history. I'm throwing it back to you. I know. I, I, that's what I've been sitting here thinking about. I'm yeah. not really sure. I mean. Do we do, don't we do oral, oral history really well here? Don't we like, I stopped that sentence at don't we do oral? And then like there's somebody on tape and I'm like, where's he going? Um, don't we do like storytelling and oral history and narrative pretty well at Virginia Tech? Isn't that a thing that some people here do? Yeah. Well, if we do that well, there's a place. That's a resource. When I got involved with Safe Zone and, and kind of brought up history as a, oh wow, we actually have a history, and people were like, what is our history? You know, it was really yeah. amazing how many people just didn't know. Sure. And, and even like Danny was saying, I think it was Danny, sorry if I'm wrong, um, but you know, we're not taught, mm -hmm. you know, most other heritages or, or groups, but because the way we sit within society, we're not brought up with this kind of information. It's not, not yes. greatly emphasized in any history yes. books or you know anything. And so you're kind of thrown in it at, at a point and you're basically a sink or swim kind of situation. And most people are like, okay, I don't really care what happened in the past. I just want to survive you know, forward. And at some point, <coughs> hopefully, they get to it and say, well, where did this all, you know, what what did this all come from? Where, yeah. What was the struggles that people before me faced? Yeah. Right on. We don't have, um, I mean, I was very impressed Some that word. the LGBT History Month was started by a high school teacher who said, we need this. I mean, mm. the, the whole reason we have an LGBT History Month is he said, 
we need to teach these kids about LGBT history. And then when it got too big for him, he handed it over to a, a national group who then helped, you know, proliferate it. But it was one person. It was right. it was that, you know, it wasn't a top down. It wasn't some grand government organization that said, oh, we need this. It was one teacher. Mm -hmm. A catalyst. Right. Uh, a quote. People do not make their own history. Sorry, they'll do the quote right. People make their own histories, but they do not make them out of nothing. They make them out of the conditions given from the past. Paraphrase Karl Marx. It's on camera. There's still something I'm supposed to swear off as a U.S. citizen to get a visa. Um, or Santayana, those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. Although I think this has been misattributed to Santayana, I'm not sure. Um, yeah what the, the labor involved, not just ideological, just knowing something, the labor involved in, in when you understand historical circumstances that, that preceded you, that changes what we can do. We can, we can do something with this. Although now I'm, now I'm talking with some anxiety because somebody's in here doing, doing memory. Um, so <laughs> I may have, to, may have to defer, you know, there's some conversation here. Maybe, maybe now that now that we're a little over an hour, one or two more questions. This is just kind of a silly question, but if we were to have the Rainbow Hokie Bird, would it stand on campus without vandalism, or would it? I mean, what would actually happen? Maybe that's a project we could actually try. Yeah. Um, see, you know, something as simple as that. Sure. Let's see if we can get it right in that chapel. <laughs> right there, right in the chapel or out front. Let's see. Let's give it a try. Um, or like, like, it can have like some rainbows, but it'll be in some sort of like wedding dress. It'll be fine. You know, this will be fine. Or something or a tuxedo. Um, Maybe partnering with the visual arts department, which has not really been a priority of the curriculum at Tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or our, um, you know, uh, our statues of uh, statues, not just the hokey board. I mean, part of that are statues of of figures whom historically made possible this conversation, right? I mean, the, the things like the hokey bird matter, but also adding in, you know, having on the walls the reminders that um, we do what we do on the shoulders of people who took a lot of risks. <coughs> so yeah, I'm I'm I I'm cool with it. I'll show up. I'll also gladly sit with the people who are like, why are you putting that in the chapel? Um, yeah, please, and then Danny. So I guess the last two comments, and then, yeah. I want to relate to the comment as to where to put this symbol of identity. And here comes the issue of management of heritage. And those things that, which are not done for the Chinese, right. one should think about what to do and how to do. Just for the sake of the example, in the, the big memorial in, in Berlin, in, in Germany, about the, all the people that were murdered in the Holocaust, a decision was not made until they found the right plastic, the right nylon, the right material to make the status quo. Hmm. Because one has to think what happened the day after where people will decided provocatively to pee there, or to use a spray to, for graffiti reasons. So those, the things that you mentioned, where to put it, those are things that are supposed to be highly managed, and a huge amount of research should be done where to put it in such a way that will benefit from it, and it's a question who will benefit and how will benefit, mm. rather than you will say, okay, I build the status, and the day after it was uh, destroyed and the day after two kids were uh, being heated here because they were recognized and thought to be gay men. And as to the questions about this, that when we build one space, we have to unite ourselves. Yes, that, that's an issue. And for this I would argue, and this is what I'm trying to, I regard queerness some extent, even as a civilization, more than cultures, it's an attitude. And if you have this in mind, 
and you say, okay, we have one space, but she will have her own tribe who will be presented there. Your tribe will be presented there. Her tribe will be presented in a, but you'll have something in common, and this is, again, it's supposed to be grassroots, then things can initiate. And read about the, the evolution of the heritage, of the Christian heritage, of the Jewish heritage. Every heritage, <coughs> there is always this debate, um, we are not from the same tribe. We are actually from, not from the same community. And actually you cause me to think about my community, and actually I'm asking you not only to think about your community, but how you differ from her, because she's a woman, she's an American, etc. And do you really have something in common? And only after, and it's not necessarily people here, it's supposed to maybe the elite will decide, because it's done by the elite. The elite doesn't have to be rich, but they have to be the elite, with the help of monetary and resources, and things like this, can have tremendous importance. I don't know. I'm, what's going, if I want to illustrate my children and to let them know there are gay and lesbian people and this is who they are. So where I'm coming from, just for an example, there is a gay and lesbian forest. We got to get a forest. <laughs> so simple. Yeah. It's a well known that. Um, <coughs> It's always getting bigger and bigger because gay and lesbian people go and plant their trees and other come and help them. Just a forest. And over there I can take my children and they have a chance to socialize with gay men hmm. and, and lesbian well, with whatever whoever they want to. And not necessarily on the big parades with the huge music and and, and people with underwear. Fair enough, I understand the social contribution of this. But for me, it's much easier, hi, it's a forest. And it's next to, and I want to associate, next to the Holocaust survivor forest. So simple. Can't we do both? <coughs> Definitely. I mean, can't I, can't I help with the long, sort of winded, pleasant conversation about a rainbow hokey bird while also doing subversive things? Can't I, can I like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick some minor rainbow hokey birds all over the place. Like, I don't, I actually think, I want to take a question. I think we have to do both. Like, I think we have to have the subversive acts um, along with the play-along acts. It's like, it's like, well, you work more conservatively and you work more radically. We, uh, well, as an administrator, and this is what I would teach people when I would teach them lobbying and organizing, um, let me use that against you. We have to do, mul we have to use multiple approaches. Right? We can't eliminate the relationship. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. Tag team. Danny? Um, and I think this will be the last comment for, for today. Yeah. Make it good, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> start the conversation from places of difference. And I think that's an important conversation to have, and there's a reason why those conversations keep coming up, um, because certain people aren't being recognized. But how do we then start to reposition, reframe the conversation in talking about our commonality, <coughs> in talking about our humanity, in talking about our connectedness? Um, how, how do we start to do that? Like, Can I answer? Yeah. Turns out, subject of my dissertation. <laughs> uh, what I refer gently is solidarity. I think we have to talk about what happens when people relate. I don't think identity and recognition, all the things and commonality and difference have actually served us too well. Those are part of the conversation. But until we get down to some some conceptions, ideas, thinking, communication about what happens when we relate. Like, you can spend a lot of time defining what relates, define the subject, define the identity, talk about commonalities and differences of identity. We also have to talk what happens when people relate. So I'm going to take out the, connect, the, the connectedness word, take out the spatial connotation, and say, what are we talking about when we talk about connectedness or relationship? 
not just identities, not just difference, not just recognition, can do some of that, but how relationship. I'll just add, that's, that's, that's the part I want to help add. So. I mean, when I say connectedness, I, um, I hear it takes on different shapes, it looks differently to different people. I'm thinking the kind of psychic connectedness we have, um, how do we start to recognize that? How do we start to, hmm. how do we start a conversation from there? Hmm. I, I, turns out I can feel vulnerable working with you even though I don't understand you fully. I might just end up a little bit different than when I started out and I have to live with that. I'll be okay. On that note, thank you again everyone for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>